This far, we have been talking about how to create documents and collections, and also how to query documents and use operators. But we haven't really talked about data modeling. Since we're dealing with different types of database, we need to think differently about how we store and model our data. Dwight and Ryan from MongoDB says, data that is accessed together should be stored together. Meaning, if you are going to be reading or writing data together, it's usually a good idea to store them together. Instead of storing data in two different places, you should be thinking about how you might be able to embed one of those pieces into different places. You shouldn't be thinking about traditional one-to-one -one and one-to-many relationships. Also, keep in mind what is more likely in the case of your data. Take for example, like this document about movies. It has the likes array, which is an array of users' IDs. This could also be an object IDs. And where they might be thousands of likes, there will be most likely hundred or less. And since we are storing an ID, in most case, an array will be great for this. We store likes with the movies because we want to show likes with the movies. But what about features like the ability of a user to save a movie on the platform? For this option, it probably make more sense to store data in an array inside of user's document instead, because data in this case is more related to users than movies. We don't need to search all movies to find ones that with the user ID in our saved movie array. Instead here, we are just having a saved movies array inside of user document. We can even save the title of the movie there so we can display it without querying the movie itself. Since the title of the movie is unlikely to change. Same goes for actors. While it's complicated data, since it's an array of objects, the number of those objects has an upper band, the maximum number of actors in other words, that is well within a reasonable range. The reason why I mentioned reasonable range is because you want to keep in mind that all this data is going to be loaded into RAM when it's accessed. So, if one of these fields is going to have a huge amount of data in it, you might want to split that up. Let's take another example. In a relational database, you likely have users table and an address table. And you probably have another table that will link address to users. You can embed the address using a sub-document using document model, since the address only applies to the user. This makes sense because you are always going to modify and update the address in the context of a user. So by storing the user and its address together, you simplify things and you can reduce queries. Now, let's see a very different example. I have an information associated to something that is rarely read at the same time. For example, like something user click on page to load it. For example, let's say that for a movie website, we have this ridiculous feature that our manager asked for, like snacks you can eat while watching the movie or restaurants you can order from. So we will store food data and snacks and restaurants and all of that. And it makes sense to store separately as we will really read and written. And thus we will reduce, for example, how much RAM we can use. To do this, we should consider using indexing in both documents. So far, we've mostly been talking about one-to-one -one relationship, but what about one-to-many? One-to-many could be something like a movie and its comments. There is one movie, but many comments. 
and with the success of our website, we will have more and more comments. We might not want to store those comments inside of the movie document. Instead, we can store them in a separate collection of documents and we can still benefit from MongoDB to improve performance and data. We can change our UX so that the page will load some comments like the top rated, then the user can press see more button to get the rest of our comments. So this way, we store the top on the movie and we leave the rest in a separate document. This can change the performance dramatically because on the first load and under most cases, you like never have to query your movie document because everything you need is under the movie document. Part of the reason why we store comments or top comments under the movie instead of user document is because it's unlikely for a user to want to see all the comment that he made. Instead, it is mostly likely for a user to request all comments on a movie. So now that we have an idea about data model, the next step for us is to talk about indexing. Indexes are very important in databases. Having a basic understanding of indexes will help your application and code work better. While this topic can get very deep and complex, the basic idea of indexing is very simple. Just think of it like an index of a book. An index that will allow you to work quickly and search for your data without having to read or scan the entire book. Let's start finding out how indexes work in MongoDB. For fun, let's work with another database about movies instead of our recipes database. You can also find it and upload it to MongoDB using MongoDB Compass or MongoDB Import as we have done before. So, I want to run some queries on my data. I'll do a simple query to find all movies where the runtime is equal to or higher than 162. So I'll just use the operator $GT and compare it to 162. So if we choose to only show the title, we get only three movies, Avatar, Interstellar, and The Wolf of Wall Street. Now, Let's add another command to help us see what happened under the hood. So we will keep the same find query, but we will add at the end the command explain. And we need to get some extra information from explain. So we are going to ask for the execution stats. This will bring up a high number of information, but we are mainly interested with execution stats and total docs examined. So we can see from here that the query had to examine 16 documents, which is the number of documents that we have in our collection. Now imagine if we had like 10,000 or million documents. Well, that might not be so great. So let's now run another query and we will also do explain on it. So we're going to look for the movie with its ID and we are going to ask it to explain this query for us. One single problem and here we go. Again, we will focus on the execution stats and the total of docs examined. And we find the number of documents examined is one. Well, how did this happen? Well, simply because the ID has an index on it. So the index increase our performance on our query. And we can also see that the needed time is less than when we use it the runtime. But more on that after. So this way, if we had it one million movie, we would have avoided 999,999 movie with one simple index. We can get special information about index by running a simple command, which is db.movies.getindexes. We can also use indices, whatever you like. And you can see that we have one index on the ID, which by default created by MongoDB. 
So that's how the query was able to jump up to the right document when using the search by the ID field. Now, how do we create indexes? Well, easy. We just use our collection movies and then we will specify that we want to create an index and we just tell it what we want to create the index on. Since we did this on runtime before, let's go ahead and tell it to do it on that. And then you need the direction you want the index to go. You can do it either ascending or descending. Just like the sort, so I choose it ascending, which is one, and then I run it. And it tells us that the index was created. And if we run get indexes again, we can see that we have a new index called runtime one. That's the default name, but you can change it and give it its own name if you want. Now, if we rerun our previous query, we can do the runtime. Then we will see that the total number of documents examined is three, which is the number of documents returned. And the number of time needed is zero, which is very different than the last time where it was 14. Now to remove an index, we can use the drop index command. For that, we are going to need db.movies.drop index and then the name of our index that we just created, which was runtime one, and that's it. And it will drop the index. Now, if we run again, get indexes, we can see that we only have the ID, which is the default for MongoDB. There are a lot of options on indexes like unique, which will make sure that any two documents can't have the same exact field or any value twice, or compound index that can have two or more fields in them, and even use spatial index and a lot more. But the important bit to remember is to examine the queries you are running and make sure that you have the proper index on those fields. Next, we are going to talk about how we can store files in MongoDB using GradeFS. But first, to test your knowledge, here's a question for you. A default index is created on which field? The first field, the first field with a number, the ID, or there is no default field index. Take five seconds to think about it. Yes, you're right. The default index is created on the ID field, which is also the default object added to our document by MongoDB. 